Thank you, Mukesh. Um, good morning. Yeah, Mukesh and I are classmates, and we spent many, many times in the campus, and campus is a wonderful place where you build bonds, and the bond's still strong as ever. Um, this is a great honor for me to come here and uh, talk to you about my experience, and I'm going to be um, talking a mu taking a much more narrower view uh, rather than a broader view. I think uh, Mukesh set a great platform where he indicated the strength of a society is clearly indicated by the innovation and the entrepreneurship. And it's a clear example that we heard this morning about California's economy is clearly dictated by that one single thing. You know, it, innovation has to penetrate every different aspects of life because there's so many problems to be solved. And as you, as, as you get larger populations, there'll be more problems. And the only way to solve is to have many entrepreneurs attack those problems. So as uh, Sudhir Reddy mentioned, the, the mechanics of going through that, so for sure I went through the same thing, so I'm gonna actually walk you through my personal experience and I'm gonna take a very narrow view of how much unpredictable that scope is. It can be high one day, the very next day it's low. So I'm gonna walk you through those. Um, but before we get started, So you gotta ask yourself, why do you wanna become an entrepreneur? It is such a difficult task. It's not an easy one. And, and every time I start, I ask myself the same question. Why am I doing this again? It's very difficult, starting from the fact that you have to validate your idea with a million people and everyone will put it down. And then after that, you have to, once you've justified the idea, you've got to go look for money and no one wants to give you money because you don't have the equity. The trust equity is zero. In my, in my case, when I started the first one, it's negative. They said, where are you from? Okay, which school are you from? Ah, none of those count. So it's, you're starting at negative to get to zero and build up. But having said that, it's a wonderful experience once you go through that. And that's why it's very addictive. Oh, I think we're restarting this. See, what did I tell you? <laughs> this. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Yes. Okay. Is that okay? Mm, yeah, okay. Should I plug this? Yeah, you can put it up there. Uh, okay. Oops. I need some more help here. Uh, I think it's connected, but something else popped up here. Oh, you need a Wi-Fi. Is it? Can you put the PBT up there? This is exactly the reason why you want to be an entrepreneur, because nothing is predictable, right? So, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you exactly what drove me into this space, and then you can use that as a way to judge whether you want to get into this. So the first and foremost that, that drove me into this was the fact that I needed complete freedom and independence for everything, starting with the thought process, execution, and maybe there's money, but in the beginning, no such thoughts, because for me, the nine to five was very structured, not me. I don't want to go in at nine and come back at five. I may want to go in at nine, may come back at nine at night. Or I want to go in the afternoon, come back later. The whole idea of the freedom, the, the complete independence to thought process and execution was just overwhelming for me. And the current job was not challenging. The, and there is always something new happening. Why? Because there's always a problem. Any, any solution actually creates 10 other new problems, so why not solve any one of those problems? And the opportunity to leverage all of the skills that you have. In a structured environment, no one will let you do that. Here, I have full freedom to go experiment. I may fail, but failure is okay in this area. The maximum you're going to lose is you're going to start all over again. And the multidisciplinary aspect of your... Um, skill set is very hard to exploit in a structured environment. In a startup, it's very easy. 
Then the last two are probably what you generally hear about. It's about the job creation, it's about wealth creation. Those things I did not even think about. I said, you know, hey, I want to be a chip designer. I came to this country seven years after graduation, going through Singapore and all that. I said, I want to be a chip designer. I want to be the best chip designer. And lo and behold, at that time, the new tool sets that were coming in was just disrupting the way chips were de being designed. We could design chips in six months, nine months, and chipsets were coming out at such a rapid rate that I could actually put my character into a chip. So that was such an attraction for me to be get into this thing. So, so when, when you get into this mode of finally deciding, okay, all this is exciting, I want to be an entrepreneur, then you suddenly look at yourself and say, what do I have that will make me a good entrepreneur? And I started looking at all the strengths and the weaknesses and things like that, which you probably will all go through. The one thing you want to be sure is you don't want to get into it just for the heck of it. You, know? you want to be at least good at one thing, if not more. Because the, the, the important thing in an entrepreneurship is you will have to do more things than just one. All the way from janitorial to coffee machine to actually designing the chip to selling the chip to going and doing all the biz dev activity. If you like it, then, it's that, then this is it for you. The other aspect of it is also being very passionate. People are going to put you down, beat you down. You know, the design is not good. This is not working. But the aspect of being passionate about what you're trying to solve and keeping that, the, the problem in focus and the solution that you're going to provide will drive you. And if, if that's the case, then this is the one. So I, you know, and then the other thing is I love, Hello? Yeah. Hello. This one died, I think. That's fine. And you have to be a student for life because the reason is the answers are not known and the problems you're trying to solve is new. The answers are not yet created. Once it becomes created, then it becomes a commodity, then why, why innovate there? So innovation time, you have to be a, like a student trying to learn and no one's got the, all the answers. And you have to be a great team player, otherwise you won't be able to bring in all the talent that, you, that Sudhi Reddy was talking about. Because at the end of the day, Mukesh was mentioning that you go from nobody to somebody, your battle is to become nobody again. Because you've got to surround yourself with many somebodies. And, though, and that's the only way to success, right? The weaknesses that I always had at the beginning, the very first time, was my network. My network was not large enough either to acquire talent or other resources, particularly capital. And I, I talked about trust equity. Where, the, where does the trust equity come from? It's based on how long has somebody seen you, known you, worked with you. That's how you build the trust equity. It cannot be built overnight. So the first company when we started, our trust equity, combined trust equity was so minimal. So. I went on, the very first company was in 1991, that's where we designed a spot chip set. That company was actually acquired by Alliance Semiconductor in 93, and then in 93, six months later, we actually did go public. The company had actually had a fantastic run for four years, but I started getting bored because we were just designing graphics chips every six months. And, shall I plug this one in? So, four years later, you know, we, we started looking at the fact that internet was coming on. And in 1995 is when commercial internet became, you know, uh, emails were ex available to everyone and it was getting commercialized. So my f two friends of mine in, um, NIM in Alliance and I, we started exploring what other opportunities exist to provide chips. I'm still thinking chips all the way. You know, chips is a very complex thing. I, th I said, that's where I can contribute. So we actually did start a company in 97, four years after Alliance acquired Nimbus. 
to once again get, go through this path. So I'm going to walk you the next few slides about that specific thing, the highs, all of the th highs we felt and the lows following. Subsequently, you know, 90, in 2003, um, you know, I ended up starting Yumi Networks, which is a video delivery platform that's public now in uh, NYSC. And then after that, I decided this is not for me. I'm getting there. I just got to slow down and take it easy. And so for about eight years, I was just trying to be nobody. I didn't want anybody to recognize me. I just go away in the background, travel the world, and things like that. But my son wouldn't let me sit quiet. So last year, we started a company called Idealist. We have a platform for product management, which allows you to take it all the way from ideation to release. And the product is called Profecta. So now I'm actively working with him. He's, he's putting me to work. So I do a lot of blogs. So a lot of the details in, in and around my entrepreneurship is, is actually coming out in blogs. So look, look me up in, in uh, Medium. So let's focus on the high points, particularly Lara Network, Networks. Its parent company was called Lara Technology. We founded that in 1997. So this time we didn't have to go for money because we had some decent amount of cash with us. So the three founders actually contributed $50,000 each. We hired four guys. We got the first semblance of a, um, a cell for internet router that we built in, 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 in the office. Took it out to Cisco, um, Juniper, a variety of networking companies. After about 17 trips to Cisco, finally Cisco said, yeah, we like what you guys are doing. Can you combine some other aspects of the thing into the chip? We want to work with you. So we had the conversation with Andy Bechtelsheim. I don't know how many people know Andy. He's a very famous guy. He's all the way from Sun Micro, and currently he's the, he's the main founder of Arista Networks. So he talked with us one afternoon, and he said, we want you guys to build the TCAM. It's a ternary content addressable memory. It's the very first one of its kind that's going to be built and instituted in all the routers. And what it does is it actually takes the performance of a router from 100,000 transactions to 300 million transactions per second. So it's a huge performance boost. And sure enough, we signed the deal, and February of, nine, uh, I think it was 1998, June of 1998, we actually delivered the product. And as you can see, that's the plaque that, that commemorates that moment. And as we speak, today, Arista and Cisco are fighting on that same technology. So that's how valuable that technology was. And I, it, was a, it was a major high for us. Thank you, thank you. And the second part of it is also the, the semiconductor technology was actually moving from 0.3 micron to quarter micron technology. The very first one was being put out by IBM and ST, and we were also one of the first products running through that line. And so these were all pretty high achievements, and we were able to close a Series A. So we, would, we thought, okay, life is made. Not so, not so quick, because the next year, um, and actually in 1999, end of 99, early 2000, the board decided that we have too much valuable com properties within one company. They wanted to break it up, so they broke it up as Lara Networks and Empowertel Networks. We were just three founders. It was a horrible experience because the three of us had to manage two different companies, 450 employees, five locations, not an easy task. And amongst us, we have to keep everyone up to date. What what was going on in each of the companies. It was the most horrible experience in my life. Had we done it differently, I would have probably said, no, just keep everything in one place, let's keep it growing. That was the first one. But what happened is, when we actually split the company, there was a marketing manager who came up with a great idea of leveraging the IP that was co-owned by Cisco and us to, to create a, a, a product for the, for the general market. And Cisco just got really angry and threatened to sue us, and that put a complete bind on our productivity for about 12, six to eight months, I think, and we lost the next design win with Cisco. So TCAM 1, we are there, TCAM 2, we lost, and now company is split into two, the three founders don't know who's managing which company, and so eventually in June of, June of 2000, I said, no, I'm shifting all my focus to Lara Networks, which was the the, the product that we were shipping to Cisco. And I managed to hire 
a friend of mine who at that time was Intel, so he and I made another 17 trips to Cisco to finally win back TCAM 3. So we actually, that was another high for, you know, going, you know, it's so unpredictable, a small variation in how you decide what to do can change, can make or break the company. So we not only we won the design, in June, I saw the market collapse. Bec the reason is I had a, uh, a person in the distribution side, I had him go and uh, figure out what's going on with all the Cisco uh, contract manufacturers. What we found was an oversupply of products that are sitting in the warehouses in the background. I said, oh, it's a bad news. But Cisco is giving us the information saying, no, keep producing more. And so we said, no, this is getting, getting out of control. And we had to quickly turn around and raise money. And we raised about $40 million just before the last uh, collapse, which was in mid, uh, end, of, end of July of 2000. That was it. No one was writing checks anymore. It was the last check, probably one of the last checks I collected. And sure enough, I said, OK, at least for two years, I can survive here. And what we had done in that process of actually uh, converting Cisco's product to uh, use TCAMs as opposed to memory is it was draining away all of the revenue from Cypress. And Cypress was getting hit on the bottom line. So Cypress turned around and acquired uh, uh, Lara Networks June of 2001, just before the whole market collapsed. And I was in um, Cypress for about two and a half years. And then I started Yumi, and I, once again, I said, no, I got to do something different. And I said, I wanted to go into consumer internet applications because there's a whole new paradigm has evolved, and there's a lot more opportunities there to do. So what I would say is, whatever you do as an entrepreneur, just walk the, just walk the talk. Don't overpromise. Don't be another Theranos. Don't cheat. Be patient but be fair with all your employees. That's the only way to success. Uh, there's no two ways away. Uh, you know, the market will punish you otherwise. So a lot more of the details are in my blog, which is in, um, on Medium, and, and it's titled Unicorn, Decacon, What Next? If you get time, please do read it. And thank you. And this is the company I'm with, uh, with my son, and it's a whole different experience. He's a millennial. He's teaching me what to do, how to write. And so I'm actually learning all over again what entrepreneurship is again about. Thank you.